Hello, John Talley here with Partzilla.com. Welcome back to another edition of our live Friday at 3. So once again, I'm in the studio by myself, and those extra checks, they're just not getting written to me. Chelsea, what's up? I mean, if I'm going to do their job, I should get paid for, for their work as well. <clears throat> at any rate, we're going to suffer our way through this. And as promised, we're going to lead off with a question that has now been asked of me two weeks in a row that I haven't addressed. So we're going to start off with that one. I can't remember the person's name, but he has an 05 Honda Foreman 400, and I believe he has the automatic model, so the FA. And he was having a problem with code 12, which is the shift motor. And with that particular model, it is the the automatic version, and I think it has a, basically a three-speed. I think they borrowed most of that technology from the uh, from the um, automotive side of Honda. Let me hit mute on this. So at any rate, I did a little bit of research, and it's not that complicated of a circuit, and Code 12 specifically is directed toward the circuit itself and the shift motor, which I happen to have one right here. So basically there's two wires going into it and it's either sending uh, 12 volts in one direction or the other to get it to spin one direction or another. So what you're gonna need to do is go up, I believe it's under the front plastics, you will see a connector that it is known to get dirt in there and hence make uh, these connections get corroded. Unplug those, see if they're dirty, see if this O-ring is damaged and not sealing it up as it should. Then go in with your voltometer if you have one and just do a quick resistance check across the terminals of the, the motor itself. And what you're going to be looking for is somewhere in the neighborhood of one, one and a half to two and a half ohms, somewhere in that neighborhood. You just don't want to see an open circuit and, and you certainly don't want to see anything less than you know, 0.5 ohms. If that isn't it and that you see for the, the resistance that you should there, go back to where your PCM is and there's going to be a five um, wire connector back at that location. Those two wires that we just talked about here, they're in that particular bundle of wires. And what you want to do is do a continuity test from that five wire connector. You'll need to get an owner's man or service manual so you know the wire colors and check the continuity of those two wires. And at that point, go and check, put plug this back in and see if you can read that same resistance that you read up front. Now, if all of that checks out, then you can actually send voltage to directly to the motor once it's unplugged from your battery or another um, 12 volt, volt source just to see if it's turning or not. Now, if you've eliminated all that and you're sure that your wiring is good to go and you're sure your motor is still operational, then it's more than likely going to be your PCM. So do those tests and then let me know what you find because I'm curious about this one. All right, and boy, are the questions starting to flow in. So let me scroll back up and start at the top. <clears throat> Lucas is uh, asking me, how bad does it not have an air, cage, air filter cage like the inside of a 400EX? Uh, that would be not advisable because you're basically dealing with an air compressor. That's what your engine is, and it is pulling in air and then expelling it. And without that cage, around the, uh, the inside of the air filter itself, it's just gonna collapse it. I mean, it's gonna pull in enough, pull through enough air, it's just gonna collapse all the way down and it's gonna choke off your motor. So I wouldn't recommend, recommend that at all. <clears throat> Sam has asked me, what are some signs of a bad starter clutch for a CRF250X? What parts on the starter assembly usually go bad for that model? The starter clutch is basically, it looks like a bearing on the inside and it's got a ring on the inside. And when you rotate this way, it, those, I don't want to call them bearings, but it almost looks like a spindle bearing. It'll let it flow one direction. If you try to reverse it, they bind up and that's what causes it to lock in place, which in turn allows it to start. Free wheels in one direction, catches in the other. Those wear down over time, and when they wear down, it doesn't want to engage fully, or it just starts to slip. So that's what you're, that's one of the signs of a bad starter clutch. Well, it doesn't you know, engage quickly, and if it does engage, it doesn't have enough friction in there or force to actually turn the motor over. So it's usually inside of there that usually wears out. 
All right, Nick is asking me, hey John, I got my car rebuilt and cleaned by the Honda dealership near me. I put it back on and it runs okay. It idles good, but when I tap the gas for a second, um, the RPMs go up and then won't stop. Hmm. Well, that sounds like the return spring is not doing what it's supposed to on the throttle body itself. And I would be a little bit suspect if your um, throttle cable is kinked up a little bit and or maybe needs to be replaced or lubricated because it sounds like it's opening it up and then it's just not wanting to pull it back. <clears throat> so check your plates themselves or the throttle plates to see if it's actually got some tension on there. Make sure they didn't miss a uh, return spring. They shouldn't have pulled that off, but make sure that it's not binding somewhere in your, your throttle assembly. All right, <clears throat> Preston's asked me, after I replaced my bad battery, my digital display pops on and doesn't have this problem before. Any thoughts, please? My digital display pops on. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not following you there, but I'm give me a little bit more information as to when you say it pops on, what does that mean? Plus, give me the year, make, and model of the machine that we're talking about. YK said, thanks for the recent Honda Ranch rear brake video. You're adding more and more to, to my to-do list. Yeah, have fun with that one. Um, but we had a feeling that one was going to do well. And uh, this particular machine, it was, it was easy. Um, I've seen so many where all of those... Uh, Parts don't come apart quite so easily, but glad we could help out and hopefully yours won't be too much of a pill to get pulled apart. <clears throat> All right, Lucas is also asking me, are 400EX's loud top ends, I uh, hear it's like ticking, what could that be? More than likely that's just a, a one of the valves out of adjustment. You know, so if it's going tick, 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 that's usually the rocker arm with too much clearance on top of the uh, the valve itself, and it's just letting it bounce too much and making the clicking sound. So adjust the valves, and I'm pretty sure we did a video that shows you how to uh, how to do that on that particular make and model. All right, <clears throat> Jack is asking me, hey, whenever I go to start my Honda Rancher 350, sometimes it makes a clicking sound and doesn't turn over. It has a brand new battery. All right, that definitely sounds like your starter solenoid, and that's gonna be back at the back of the uh, machine under the seat and I'm pretty sure we went through a diagnostic on that particular model. Um, if your battery's good, you know it's good, and you can hear it click. Sometimes those, con it's basically a switch. That's all a solenoid is. Those contacts will get worn down and dirty after a while, especially if they're not making contact all the way. And that's more than likely what's happening to yours. So it's just making that connection um, uh, that's actually sending power from the battery to the starter intermittently. So more than likely you're going to need to replace your star starter solenoid because it sounds like it's on its way out. All right, Nick also added in, also it, it won't run unless the choke is on. When I push the choke cable, it bogs and dies. Whew. Well, that tells me that your idle jet is still stopped up, so I'm a little suspect of just how well the, uh, the dealership cleaned that out. Because, I mean, I know that the, uh, of course, your idle jet's going to be extremely small, and that's the first one that stops up without question. But you're describing is if there's still something inside of that jet. I would be curious, I'd look at your, um, your, your invoice or the, the work order and see if they just cleaned what was there or if they put in a, uh, a kit, maybe something from Moose, um, Moose Racing. And I'd go back to them and say, all right, guys. I paid you to do this, <laughs> and we're not getting anywhere. So go ahead and bring it back to them. It sounds like they, they uh, didn't do a very thorough job, or something may have been stirred up when they did do the cleaning, and now it picked up that one little piece and stopped up that idle jet. It happens. I mean, so don't be a, go in with a positive attitude and see if they can straighten it out for you. All right, Carl's asking me, why does it hurt the drive belt on a Polaris Ranger 900 XL to drive in high gear going slow speed? Main reason being you're putting so much torque on the inner side of that sheave, and when you do that, it's creating a lot more heat, and hence it's going to wear out your belt and possibly overheat the belt and then make a burn spot in it. When you run it at a lower gear, when you're in a high torque situation, it is further out on the sheaves, both on the, the imp the input and the output side, and that's more or less its comfort zone. Uh, imagine you're trying to ride a 10-speed bicycle 
going slowly in top gear, uh, how tough that is to do. Well, the same gear ratio applies to your, your sheave system because that's basically what it's doing is changing your ratio by the positioning of the belt in between the two sheaves. Um, I, I know that we did, I think it was on a Polaris, I did an explanation of you know, how the sheave system works. So if you would uh, go to our playlist and I can walk you through the fundamentals of uh, how that particular setup run or operates. All right, Joe is asking me, <clears throat> hello, sir. Thanks for your videos. I have an 07 CBR 600RR front brake rotor. It is true. Is it true the round bobbins are supposed to be to flex or rotate or remain stationary? I believe it's a floating rotor. Okay, are you talking about the, uh, the rivets that are actually holding the, the disc on? Uh, those shouldn't rotate. <laughs> those should be very, very fixed because there, there should be no play or wandering in the, uh, the rotor itself. So uh, my answer would be no. <laughs> so I, I may need to replace that one. Uh, Zayed is asking me, hello, is the Honda TRX-90 engine good? Now, the, uh, the Honda, the, the TRX-90, has been, that basic design has been around forever, and it is bulletproof as long as you do your basic maintenance on it and change the oil and the, uh, keep it, uh, the air filter clean. Yeah, it'll basically run forever. So the answer, yes, they are good engines. <clears throat> well, Dennis, you say you, love, you say you love the videos or refer back to them all the time. Well, glad, glad we could help. That's what we're here for. <laughs> Paul, yippee, it's Friday. Woo <laughs> Finally got that 2004 Yamaha Bruin running and back together. I hope the owner will, will spend the uh, money to get the rest of it done right. Hope so too. All right, Giovanni's asking me, I drive an 03 Honda CBR 600 RR. When I ride the front wheel feels much higher than the back and it feels uncomfortable. I have a Dunlop Q3s. Does it have to do with the PSI on the Dunlops? It, it shouldn't. I would wonder if it's, um, those Dunlops have the correct um, ratio as far as their sizing. Of course, their, their diameter is going to be side, but I'd be wondering about the aspect ratio as far as height and width, and uh, maybe they're a little bit bigger in diameter on the outside because um, you didn't match them up properly. But that being the case, if you just don't want to go with the tires as they are, you can adjust the, uh, the front clamps on the, uh, on the bike just to drop it down a little bit. Now, it's going to change your gym, uh, steering geometry a little bit, but at least it's going to level out the ride at that point. Paul's asked me, do you have any videos on any 2004 models? I don't think we've hit that year yet. Which model are you looking for? <laughs> Mike's asking me, when will they come out with a drum brake, disc brake conversion kit for the 2017 Honda Rancher? Good question. Uh, it, it shocks me that Honda hasn't, um, and many of the other manufacturers, as far as their utility type machines, why they haven't changed up to a, a, a standard caliper and a disc setup, a hydraulic versus the drum brake stuff. I don't know. Uh, they don't involve me in those meetings, so the bean counters. Uh, they must say, nope, it wouldn't be worth it because it would change the price by, I don't know, $110, and that just may put it out of reach. Good question, though. I'd like to know that myself because the, the drum stuff's been around for way too long. <laughs> All right, David's asking me thoughts on the Vortex ECU for the YFC450R. David, I'm not familiar with the, that particular one. Is that an open architecture ECU, or is it pre-programmed to, um, to a certain setup for whatever you know, modifications you've done? Uh, I'll, I'll pick around, and uh, guys, make a note of that one, and let's, let's take a peek at the Vortex ECU and see what it's about. Why not? Jordan is asking me, I just bought a 2021 YZ250. Congratulations. How long does it take to break in an engine? A day in my opinion, especially on a race machine. Um, go, we actually did a video and it went into the different, different break-in procedures that I follow for either uh, utility or sport or race conditions. Uh, but with a, a race machine like that, I run it through one heat cycle, make sure everything's good to go. And then I'll run it to 80 or 90% for about an hour. 
then I'll drop the oil, refill it with what I'm going to run in it, whatever that might be, a synthetic or a synthetic, and drop the hammer, let it go. But that's the way I do it. Other people have, may have different, a different opinion of that, but I always believe to run them like you're going to run them long term. And with a bike like that, it was designed to be run hard. So let it rip. All right, David is asking me, a 2006 Grizzly 660, um, how to check the reverse speed limiter. I have to play with it in order to get it from stop cutting out, and it sounds like it's backfiring. What, it sounds like it's doing what it's supposed to do, because um, if I remember correctly, the reverse speed should only be in between, I think, six to eight miles an hour, somewhere in that na neighborhood, maybe up to 10. And if it's letting you go past that, that would tell me it's not working correctly. But when you start getting into the limiter, that's what it does. It'll actually make it backfire, and you know, it's, it's basically cutting ignition to it, if I remember correctly, is how it works. <clears throat> All right, um, R is asking me, how does one become an ATV motorcycle mechanic? I'm pretty much self-taught uh, taught for the most part in the beginning, but as I progressed further into it, it became, um, well, not necessary, but it was, I was able to advance a lot more by each manufacturer by going through their tra training courses. Um, but if you're just going to start from scratch, I mean, there's several different um, schools out there, one of the best ones uh, around is the MI, MMI, Motorcycle Mechanics Institute. They have a, a, a strong program where they can start you out from ground zero and then build you up from there. But for me, I started out as uh, the shop cleanup boy at the uh, local Honda dealership here in Albany, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, actually I was able to work under three really talented mechanics and I just paid attention and watched what they did and picked up on it little by little. I'd watch them work and do a certain procedure, and then I'd go home and work on my own machine until I figured it out. But there's a couple of different avenues. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're wanting to get serious about it, then you know, maybe consider uh, joining one of the schools and going through one of their programs. And then once you're actually at a dealership, take advantage of any training that they have from the manufacturers because it is extensive. Uh, I don't care which one you go to. They, they've got classes, and um, I'm still doing that because even just trying to keep up with the units as they uh, they change from year to year, I'm actually a little bit behind. So uh, I need to get back in school myself. It's uh, nobody knows it all, and uh, all about you know just continuing the learning process. <clears throat> all right, Lucas is asking me at idle my head. Headlights are nice and bright, but as soon as I tap the gas, they dim. Is that the wiring harness? No. Um, if anything, it should be operating the exact opposite of what you're describing to me. Typically, the lights are dim, and as you, you raise your RPMs, uh, they, they get brighter. So that makes me wonder if either your voltage regulator, rectifier, and or stator is having a problem. So if you would get a meter kind of like that, do a static test, you know, it should be around 12 and a half volts, then um, fire it up and then let it idle and you're probably gonna be around the 13 and then as you increase the, the, uh, the RPM, your voltage should come up as well. Maybe a half a volt, maybe even up to a whole volt, so a little over 14. You know, let's check out that electrical system, see if it's working correctly, because it sounds like something is amiss there. Andy's asking me, I have a 2013 Honda 420 EFI. I replaced the fuel filter and now it will start and run for a minute and then bogs down after it sits and it will restart and do the same thing. All right, this is uh, probably just weird timing, but actually, if you would, there's a check valve inside of here. And if it gets stuck, it'll let some fuel pull through out of the tank, but then it creates a vacuum and doesn't let it pull through anymore. So I would say first check, make sure this isn't stopped up, and then you may need to replace, maybe need to replace your fuel um, cap itself. So crank it up, unscrew this a little bit, and then see what it does, see if I'm right. But more than likely, you have a uh, stuck check valve in there, probably. 
let us know. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Dre has a 400EX, and I got it to start, and it pops super loud over and over again, and it sounds like it wants to start. Had you been, what had you been doing to it? Because that sounds like the timing is off for some reason. Give me a little bit more information, because it sounds like it's trying to actually pop back through the exhaust or ignite back through the intake. And if you haven't done anything and it's still popping like that, chances are your intake valves may be a little too tight and it's trying to, you know, of course, ignite with the valve not shut all the way because they're not adjusted correctly. So if you haven't done any modifications to it and it's in an engine build, check your valve clearance at Top Dead Center. We also have a video on that particular model or I can walk you through it. <clears throat> 1999, by the way. Yep, that engine has remained the same all the way through, so that video will apply to it. Although the plastics will look a little bit different on the one I worked on, because I think it was an 05, if memory serves. All right, Joe was coming back. Yes, the 6,000 or 600R brake rotor, the round mounts that join the center mount with the actual braking service. There appears to be rubber in between the mounts. Joe, it's been a while since I've looked at a 600RR. Guys, make a note of that, and uh, I want to take a peek because now I'm curious. Um, it has been a few years since I've worked on one, so let me go refresh my memory, and uh, we'll take a look at it. David, you're welcome. Hello to the east coast of Canada. All right, uh, thanks for the videos. When replacing piston rings, do the oil, oil rings need to be gapped? Take a look at them. They're, they're so thin, um, it can be hard to get them in there because they will want to walk and, and um, kind of, <clears throat> it's hard to measure them. Uh, I've done it before. I usually just run them down there. And if I, if I can see a little bit of clearance, you're going to be okay, especially with an oil ring because they are so thin and they're basically just holding that center ring, you know, the top and bottom ones. <laughs> they're basically just there to hold it in place. So I've never had to file one down before, but uh, you can take a peek at it. But no, you, you typically do not have to gap the oil rings. It's almost impossible to do that. All right, Robert's asked me, Polaris 570 front prop shaft replacement. Any advice on replacement? Um, I haven't done one on camera for the, uh, the Polaris 570. The closest thing I've been through on that is the, uh, the 850 that we did a couple of years ago. Um, I'll, I, be I believe the battery is just right in your way. So you probably want to just start by getting it out and giving you some working room by also getting the plastics out. And then just unbolt it, unbolt it and take your time because I, I know things get real tight in there and it can be frustrating. But if you would take a, a look at the 850 playlist and see if I went through uh, pulling that front diff out or not, or prop shaft rather. All right, Paul's asking me, just a 350 motor I saw for sale on a 1997 Motor 4. I've not looked at it yet, but a harness isn't available anymore. Um, oh yeah, before I forget, where do I get that special tool for the valves? You talking about just the uh, the um, the feeler gauges, or are you talking about the uh, that Motion Pro setup I used to actually do the adjustment? Well, either way, we've got both of them. So guys, if you would drop a link for both of those two for Paul Partzilla, thank you, uh, Steve. You're welcome. Thanks for thanks for watching. All right, JT's requesting, good initials. Uh, hey, John, I'd like to see a series in the Kawasaki Bayou 220 at some point in time in the future. All right, we'll put that on our to-do list, see if we can get, get one in there. Um, Mr. Bird is saying, how often should I change the oil and filter on my Grizzly 700? Um, check your service manual. Sometimes, in my opinion, they push it out a little too far. It, I kind of gauge it on how hard you're working the machine. Now, if you're just trail riding around, you know, out in the woods, you can probably go to the max. But if you're really making it work hard, 
I'd typically cut it in half. So if it says you know 100 hours, you know go ahead and take it to 75 or 80. If you're working really working it really hard, you may want to do it every 50 or 60. Oil's cheap, engines are not. So Carter's asked me. I've got a 350 Rancher, and when I turn the key, I have no dash lights. But if I use the pull to start it, it will start, and all the dash lights will work. All right, um, I believe there is a main fuse that may be blown on yours. So check, um, I think we did a no-start condition on that Rancher 350 because that's, that's kind of what it sounds like it's describing. It sounds like your, your start circuit fuse is probably blown. So take a peek at that video and see if I'm right. Thanks for the response. All right, Morgan's asking me, <coughs> Hi, John, I have a 2019 YXC1000R SSSE. It, ha <coughs> it has a turbo, and I just bought a brand new clutch, and the two works boss under full power, and it slips the clutch. All right. Yeah, it sounds like it's getting, it's overworking the clutch. And I know they had it for the 2016 because we're going to be doing that on ours, but. Check Yamaha's website as they have a GYTR version. Then uh, this is for the 16, of course. And, but if you're increasing that much power, it may need a little bit more clamping force in there. This one's a little bit more robust around the, the, the basket itself, and the springs are a little bit you know tighter, and that it'll be able to handle the additional power that we're going to put in this one. Odds are that Yamaha has one for yours as well. If they don't, let me know, and we'll point you to the direction to get you some more clamping force, because it sounds like that's what you need. All right, guys. Whew. There goes another 30 minutes. Well, listen, I'm going to go ahead and hang it up with that one and call it a day. Well, listen, we just want to say thank you for coming by and spending some time with us and shopping with us at uh, partzilla.com. It makes all of this possible. And everybody have a great weekend, a great week, and God willing, we will see you again next Friday at 3 o'clock. God bless. <laughs>